This is going to be a wing kind of session. I had a lot of uh, black belts come up to me and came up to me and it said, instead of talking about Bruce Lee, can you show us how to strategically or tactically fight uh, a couple of different types of fighters? Like, I'm a little guy. I don't know how to fight a tall guy. Can you show us how you would fight a tall person? And somebody else said, uh, you know, I have problems with my speed. Can you show me if I'm fighting somebody real fast? how to make it easier for me to bridge that gap between me and a faster opponent. So what I want to do is, uh, I want to go specifically with questions. You've got something very specific that you think would pertain, hopefully I can answer it, <laughs> uh, that you would like to ask me about where we can kind of make this more of a discussion, kind of a semi, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a wing kind of a seminar, I can take it that way. Uh, is that okay with everybody? So, go into your head, think about, okay, what is it I would like to ask Joe? Let me see if I can put him on the spot or something. And let's take it in that direction. Is that okay with everybody? Uh, just just real fast. Let me get this out of the way. I'm not, I'm not a peddler, but uh, it's the first book I've written in 41 years in the martial arts. Uh, I was very good at taking fighting principles and conceptualizing them, taking things from the abstract plane, putting them into a, a nice support. This is a real good manual, uh, especially for you black belts or instructors who are teaching material. Um, a lot of what I got from Bruce Lee, uh, fighting principles, how to use movement against a particular type of opponent or different angles of attack. Uh, it's in that particular book. It's hard for me to explain what's in that book in a one hour. So uh, there's about 15 people already got a copy of that. You can grab one of those people, look through it. If you're interested in getting the copy, you can see us over there or check with Rob here at the end. Somebody want to hit me with a question here real fast so we can sort of get real. Not hit me with it, but just, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I've been hit. I've been hit so many times, and you get leftovers anyway. <laughs> very solid, but not very fast legs. Yes. Yeah. How do I deal with that? People with okay. Did everybody hear what he said? Uh, he's got, you didn't hear what he said. I heard it, but I didn't damn understand it. So. Maybe that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Sweetie, what? A kicker, a kicker with good footwork? Too? No, no, no. Let's let me. <laughs> Uh, doesn't mean I'm going to answer questions. I've got good strong legs, I've got a good solid base, which is sort of a foundation of a lot of the Chinese styles, okay? Uh, you, you don't see a tremendous amount of footwork in many of the Chinese styles. I used to make jokes saying most of that stuff came from the guys who worked in fishing boats and you stood in a certain way to keep the boat balanced, you know, so you're not going to see people doing jump, turn, spin kicks. And when you get our age, you ain't going to be doing that junk anyway, you know? And uh, if you think about the human being, the human spe species was not designed to be kicker anyway. We learned to work with our hands. Little babies start playing with hands, and uh, it's easy to tie your shoes with the hands, but it's real hard to tie them with the feet. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to put kicking down to compare one to the other, but just between you and me, a good puncher being a good kicker, any day hands down 100 times out of 100 times. Follow me. If anybody wants to challenge me on that, you know, go for it. But uh, so think about that number one. Uh, let me use you for a second. You awake? Yes, sir. Can I hit him for you guys? If you don't mind. All right. Anybody doesn't want me to hit my good friend, Mr. Buck, and put your hand up. Anybody doesn't want me to? Thank you. <laughs> um, what do I want to start off? Let me try to come at what we're doing. Um, number one, you see the best fighters in the world today. Okay, and everybody's got their opinion who's the best. Right. When you punch, notice at the end of a punching combination that both feet are on the ground. Therefore, I've got good balance. When I've got good balance, both feet on the ground, it's easy to execute a kick. Okay? In other words, after a punching combination, it's easy to close the door, finish the combination off with a kick. That's the way you find most logical fighters competing today or actually fighting for real, okay? Uh, number two, if you come in with a kick and try to follow through with a punch, it's harder to go from a kick to a punch 
than it is to go from a punch to a kick. Why? Because at the end of a punch, both of you are going to have my balance. Therefore, I can trigger a kick a lot faster than it is at the end of a kick where I'm on one foot to throw a punch from just one foot. Follow me? Before I could punch, I had to put the foot back down and then squeeze the trigger. So therefore, I try to train my guys. Learn to do both, which you're going to find it a lot easier being able to go from a punching combination to a kicking combination. Does that make sense, everybody? All right, so just because I have stiff legs, weak legs, stiky legs, or slow legs, doesn't mean I have to be a kicker. If I'm up against a kicker, face it. If I'm up against somebody kicking, I'm not going to stay out here and have you kick me, don't throw a kick at me, ball, back, reposition, and then I try to kick at you. Your turn, my turn. Your turn, my turn. That's where you see most people spar. And I call that accommodation spar. I'm accommodating the kicker by giving you the range that you want. Now watch this in simple language. Stick your leg up here and let me just hold your leg. Do you really need to hold on to me? <laughs> when a guy kicks, okay, think about distance. There's a trap. Don't get caught between the knee and the foot. See this little zone in here? As long as I am not in this zone, you cannot hit me with a kick, and I don't care who you are. Got me? So that means every time you kick, I'm going to be outside your foot, or I'm going to be inside your knee. Got me? Just like whenever a guy throws a punch, I'm going to be outside the fish, or I'm going to be inside the elbow. This is a trap. Don't get caught in here. If I'm fighting a good puncher, do not fight him here. Do not fight him here. If I'm fighting a good kicker, this is where the knee is. Don't get fighting here. Don't fight him here. Don't fight him here. So that means every time he kicks, see, I'm going to give him the distance that I need, not that he needs. I'm playing my distance, not yours. Remember that. Distance is the key. The first principle you work on when you spar is learn to control the distance first. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Then you work on the timing second. Then everything else kind of follows. Forget about speed, forget about power. Okay? Those aren't principles. Those are attributes. You can only work on principles. So now, that means every time he kicks, all I'm going to do is step a little out of range. See? Every time he kicks, I step a little out of range. So let's say Rob's trying to hit me with a side kick. So when he side kicks, I'm going to step out of range. Back reposition. He try to hit me with a side kick. Boom. Go. I step out of range. So I hit me side kick. I step in range. Now I'm inside the knee. Now it's my turn, because we're at hand distance. Well, God didn't make my hands for punching. I guess I have to use my elbows and my head, but see, so whatever you want to use, go for it. Follow me? So what am I playing here? Am I playing the kicking game with this guy? Peel, my leg. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? I'm playing the range game. So I'm not thinking I'm going to match your kicking speed with my kicking speed. I'm not going to match my footwork, which I don't have with your footwork. See? But one thing I can't control, I can't control this range. So I don't go, oh, I'm going to kick what I'm going to do. Watch what Rob did when he fired the side kick. Throw the side kick again, okay? Whichever leg you want to use, which leg you want to use. Right, throw it fast, fast, fast. Notice at the end of the kick, he didn't recover. Most people kick. Kick, fail for it. No recovery. <laughs> Most people, when they teach martial arts, and most instructors, and especially fighters, when they're fighting, they always look at what the guy is doing. Oh God, he's a kicker. Well, God, he kicks fast. Well, God, he likes a side kick. I never look at what the guy's doing when I'm fighting. I always look for what he's not, what he's not doing. You gotta remember what I just said. What's he not doing? <coughs> for example, it's, let's say if I'm inside, and I come in a little combination. Straight right hand, 45, the elbow stop. Notice I stop with the shoulder squared up. So if I'm Rob, I'm going to say, gee, Joe doesn't finish your combination with the shoulder in front of the chin like he should be. And when Joe goes back, Joe always moves the inside foot rather than the rear foot first. And when Joe always finishes combination, he always finishes with the shoulder squared up. So instead of giving him an angle where he can't count. You know what I'm saying? Look for what he doesn't do. And you guys who are teaching, when you teach sparring, you can start this at a white belt level because this stuff is not easy on shoulder. And you're not going to find it written down in any karate book. Okay? But it makes sparring fun because it takes you to a higher plane. 
he dropped that conceptual of it. Well, God, he's a kicker. God, he's got a good reverse ball. Ooh, he's got a good sacking. Anybody can see that. Start looking for the abstract. Start thinking in principle. Okay, principle is a simple rule which helps you maximize the effectiveness of the technique. Okay, what do you mean by principle? I said underneath this tent, we have a person in a white shirt. We have a person in a black shirt. See, we have a person sitting in a chair. The principle is in this, under this tent, we have a group of people. A group of people is a principle. Each of these individuals is an individual concept. When a guy is sparring, the technique is a, is a co simple concept, okay? He's got a fat side kick. That's a simple concept. Uh, he's got a hard side kick. That's a simple concept, okay? But the principle is when you fire a combination or any technique, you must release and recover. In principle, he's not tactically a smart fighter because he doesn't recover after he throws the punch or he doesn't recover after he throws the kick. So you discover the principle by looking not at the energy that's coming, but the energy he's not using. Yeah, the weakness is we always look at a guy's energies. I always look at a guy's face. I see what he's thinking what kind of mental energy he's got. I can look at the body, I can see if he's posing or if he's relaxed. When I talk to a guy up close, he's either speaking from here or he's tight and tense and scared. He's speaking from his ego because the neck is tight and the jaws are tight. And when he talks, the words come out, but there's no air coming out. When a person's coughing, excuse me, you would hear the air coming out. There's two things that come in my mind. Wind and the words that carry the wind. The air never lies, the words will lie, follow me? Your breathing will never lie, your feelings will never lie. The body never lies. You can hide the fact that you're scared to death by tensing up, right? You understand know what I'm saying? So always look for what the guy is not doing. And one of the secrets of teaching that, discovering that is look for the thing that's not taught in martial arts. We don't teach people about energies anymore. Or well, we use that funny word, the intrinsic chi energy, blah, blah, blah. I've seen that work in healer, but I've never seen a guy stand in front of me and make it work. Okay? Put me down with that chi energy again, I believe in it, probably. But there is such a thing. Okay? Now, go back to my point. So, Mr. Lou, what the hell did you just say? First principle, distance. If you learn, teach, educate everybody, understand distance. At what zone, at what distance am I strongest? At what zone, at what distance am I weakened? Weakest, follow me? So as Rob finishes the sidekick, see, he can follow through with a punch. So when as that foot lands, boom, the hand is in there. So there's no gap between when I finish the kick and when I begin the punch. Follow me? I don't kick, <laughs> boom, then punch. See the gap between the two? If I'm throwing two punches, it's boom, boom, one, two. As soon as one hand lands, boom, that's my cue to squeeze the second hand. I don't wait till the hand starts to come back, then say the punch in. Because now I created a gap between the two. So if I'm throwing a two, boom, two punch combination without a gap, then I want a punch kick combination, or a kick punch combination without the gap also. Do you have a gap with me so far? Am I losing? You guys look like you got a blank look like, where the hell is this guy going? What's he on? <laughs> Let me try to bring this back to a simple place. Rather me telling you 10 things to work on. If you learn to master and control that distance, what is my zone? I don't care what kick you throw. There's only, there's only uh, three types of kicks I've ever seen in my life. I know the Hop Keto guy said they got 151 different kicks. Okay. I've seen low kicks. I've seen high kicks. I've seen kicks with the front leg. I've seen kicks with the rear leg. I've seen kicks that come straight at me. And I've seen kicks that come on the curved line. I've never seen more than six kicks in my life. You ever see kick number seven short to me? So, I don't care which one of those six kicks you fire at me. You get about the 151. I've only seen six. I've looked a long time. I haven't found a secret yet, okay? All I gotta do is when you throw one of those six kicks, I'm gonna be inside your knee or I'm gonna be outside your foot. And if you learn to master that principle, you've got about 90% of fighting down for you. 
Right? Then when you're in control of that, it's easier to start spotting those energies and learn how to capitalize on what he's not doing. So, am I going to hit Rob when he's firing that kick at me? See? Why waste time throwing my arm down? I'm gonna break my arm against that circle's big leg, see? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let him miss the kick, see, at the end of the kick, see, I just made him miss. I always wanna be close enough where I can kiss it, but not get it, see? And just tap it down, all right? Blah, all that stuff. Just tap it. As soon as I tap it down, boom, I have a hand waiting for him because at the end of his kick, he's gonna pop his head right up there for me to pop. You understand how distance control comes in? So the principles learn to control their distance, Right. You don't have to worry about your footwork or what you don't have. See, when I'm fighting a guy, I don't handicap myself by thinking about, okay, when he kicked, what am I going to do? Sucker, I ain't going to let you kick. I'm going to beat you to the draw. I always do this. When you fight, there's only two ways a fighter can look. There's only two ways you can focus. I can focus on where I'm going to hit you. See? So I'm all, that means I'm always looking for an opening or I'm looking for cover. If you think you're handicapped, now you're on the defensive right off the bat. So that goes back to the first thing you all fighters must work on first. It's not technique, it's not a fighting principle. Attitude. Attitude precedes everything. You got the right attitude, sucker, you can't beat me. Come on, you ain't gonna touch me. If you don't touch me, you can't hurt me. And nobody who can't touch me can hurt me. You got me? How are you going to beat somebody like that? Does that make sense? So you put the attitude together, because it's about six or seven factors that come into attitude. Okay? You got to have confidence in your strategy. You got to have the right fighting spirit. You got to have confidence in knowing that the tactic is going to work. Follow me? See, so there's a lot of aspects. You got to know how to focus in the present tense. So you got to learn all those little extra things that make up concept attitude. Then you put that together with the right principle. Because God help you, you know. Maybe your body can do uh, three or four things at once, okay? But Or maybe your mind can think about three or four things at once. But you want to focus on one thing at a time and do one thing at a time. See? So I put 100% energies in one of them. Somebody say to you, well, gee, Joe, you know, if you, if you punch like that, look like you're open. Sucker, when I'm punching, I'm not thinking about getting hit. I'm thinking about doing the hitting. So I got 100% of my energy going into the intent of the punch. Okay? Now when I hit you, I got three things on mine. They were, I heard somebody give it a class yesterday, used an interesting word, barking. We use the same term. You ever walk into a room and a dog goes, bark, oh, you always jump. Because what's that dog saying? Watch out. Back off. So when I hit you with a punch, I want to see three things. I want to see you kneel down. I want to see you back off. Or I want to see you stop. Don't hit me back because that wasn't a real punch. Don't keep coming towards me because that means that wasn't a real punch. When you throw a real punch, a real kick, one of three things happen. He stops, he backs off, or he kneels down. Does that make sense, everybody? And you got to put see, the conviction, the emotional conviction, which is the energy emotionally, together with the proper mechanical execution. It's two things. You don't just release that energy. That's what we do with the target. Transfer the energy, go beyond release. Impact doesn't mean release. Release does not mean transfer the energy. So when you hit the guy, you throw the energy through his body. I don't know if you understand what that means, but I think of the word transfer. Does that help a little bit, get you on the right track? Now you say how you do that, right? That's why I sell books. <laughs> but you do a simple little drill. Line everybody up in class, and what I'm going to do is he's going to try to catch me in my track before I move. Because a lot of people do this stuff lunging. They never lunge. When you lunge, you're off balance. When you lunge, you have too much hang time at the end of a punch, kick, or a combination. We call it lingering. So when he side kicks, he's going to do everything in his power to nail me in these two tracks before I move out of this box. So he's going to see me in the little box before I get out of that box, he's going to try to nail me. I may get one foot out backwards or one foot to the side, but there's no way I'm going to move. Uh, no way is he going to let me get both feet out of that box. And then, of course, when I move, I always whichever direction you move, move the foot the direction you're going first, move that foot first. So if I'm going back, this foot, foot goes, rear foot goes first. 
if I move the front foot, watch, if I move the front foot first, see the body's not moving, is it? But if I move the rear foot, see the whole body moves. So I always want to move the rear foot first. See that? You got it? So, yes, sir. The stress rate strategy goes when you don't have the uh, area or space and distance to it. Okay. You still, you still go back to the point we just made. He's going to go home. He's going to write down. I'm weakest at this zone, at this distance. I'm strongest at this zone. And so, a good martial artist looks for balance. <coughs> you can't become such a great kicker that you don't ever have to punch. I know people teach that. They're stupid. You know? And it's like when the, the Gracie came out years ago. So all great fights end up on the, on the street. Well, if you're a good fighter, I never have to go to the I mean, all great fights end up on the ground. Well, if you're a good fighter, you never have to go to the ground. So you can counter anything somebody throws at you. Okay. Um, I came from a wrestling background, so of course I like the ground. My favorite move is a choke hold. My second favorite move is the bite. I like the bite the chin, the eyebrow. <laughs> if you bite the eyebrow, the guy bleeding in his eye. Most people that see their own blood, they freak. And, uh, <laughs> What's so funny? That's my when I was 12 years old. I used to, hey, I used to grab guys yes. in the headlock and we throw a bite them and take my fingers right in their head, you know. And, I was, and nobody taught me, it's just natural. And I got the guys down. I got my brother down once. He got a handful of sand, put in my face. And I said, That's dirty fighting. He said, So. You know, and so you try to add that stuff to what you know. Let me try to answer this question. Now, watch. Let's say I'm a good outside puncher. So he's your outside puncher, okay? Outside punching, outside punching. But then I get inside, the inside punching. I'll, inside punching means I can, cl I'm close enough where my shoulder can touch his breastplate. You know, good fighters are always teach you when you get close range, keep your chin on the breastplate. See, if he puts the chin on the breastplate, how are you going to knock him out and hit his chin? See, if you can pinpoint the temple, you know, some part of the neck, you might get him. But you're not going to hit him up here and do anything but bust your hand. Okay? So he's counseled out 90% of the knockout. Because the weakest part of the body is the neck. That's why when you kick a punch, I always like to go from there. I'm not going to hit you. All right? You start shaving, I won't hit you, okay? Right. Is he cute? See, women like you. Know? I say, what is it you like, man? All right, here we go. You see him laugh? All right, I'll tell you once you laugh later. This is circuit going back to uh, Okinawa was first. Okay, now watch it. Now, when I'm inside, this is what I mean by inside punch. That means my shoulder's always against his breastplate. Now say, Mr. Lewis, how do you get somebody like that? Now what? If I pull the shoulder back, see, I got the gap in there where I could come with a punch. If I say, pull the shoulder back, I got the gap where I could have cross an elbow, rising elbow, what have you. That's it? So you got outside punching, and you have inside punching. So where am I weak? Outside, inside? Am I weak at the kicking zone, or am I weak at the trapping zone in here or on the ground. And you kind of want to work out that little gap in there. And you should have drills where you can come. Uh, typically, I don't like to punch. I like to kick the legs, preferably. The weakest part of the legs is inside here. So I like to come in with a flange kick inside the shin bone, inside the knee, the neural artery. I like to go inside. Then behind that, I like to come next. Knee, head butt, bone elbows. That's how the sequence it should follow. Uh, don't put the elbow before the, the head butt. Okay? And don't put the head butt before the knee. That's the sequence they should be taught. Got me. You guys want to learn a good little self defense technique? Just grab this one, do a straight knee, crossing elbow, nose on the crossing elbow. I got this rear hand, see that little curve there? That always goes against the hairline, protect it against the counter strike. When you throw an elbow, notice both hands are open. That allows me to get more torque in the shoulder muscle. If you make fits, it makes it too tight. Ball, slide back round. Left knee, usually when I throw a knee, we protect the going first, then come in, come back, protect the going. Back across, ball, 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 ball. Knees, kind of a neat little drill. And then you put that at the end of a combination. So I'm out here, pop, pop, grab, knee, cross, slide out, cut. You just do a little, combination, mixing into what you're doing. Does everybody understand what I'm doing? That way, I create a little drill that help me integrate a technique, allow me to make the transition from one zone to the next to the next and back out. So I can flow from one zone to the other without having that gap or that weakness. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Now, what was your question?
Oh, come on, I got a short memory. But you understand what I'm saying? Close range is the way to go. I mean, uh, you're backed up against the ropes. If you're okay. If you're in a bar or you're in a Again, bar. again. Big guy, guy hits hard. I don't personally want to be. I don't want to be in front of him. Usually, I teach women in self defense when a person goes for the head, when the hands come here, always duck, cover up, so he can't defend it. And then from here, all I do is lift the arms up. From here, his brachial plexus is wide open, and I just spear, boom, right in there, boom. I don't care who you are, he's going to feel it. That'll work against anybody. No man has a tough brachial plexus. No man has a tough nose. And if all you do is hit the the break a place here, put him to the ground, he'll go down. You got to, I ain't in a hurry. <coughs> you got to go. Personally, our belief as fighters is you go for the nerve, you're going to piss me off about one second, I'll turn on the kid. So I don't teach that stuff. I'll do it to distract you, to fuck set something else up. You follow me? Does that help a little bit? I'm not trying to put down another art form, it's just that I know how fighters think. And we're always trying to show you how to tell them. There's guys that I've, I've seen you can't choke out. I have guys lock my neck and I just know how to relax, pull the chin and bring them triceps up, just relax and they can't choke. Some people got glass stars, you touch them and they can sort of hard. So I find a zone that I'm weak and then I start working on. So if, if I'm weak at this zone, I don't have the room, the space to move around, then I'm going to operate within this space. Uh, Usually, if it's a harmless person, I'll have to grab the hair and just take the hair down because that takes them right off the balance, right off the bat. Okay, I love the brachial plexus. I'll let you go right between this mastoid muscle and the Adam's apple, right in there. This is a boom, the best spot. And once he, once I've got that, he gets me everything else that I want. So, so I can go, I can go, see high, boom, low, boom, back up high, and I'll go fast, and he doesn't know what's happening. Or as soon as I go low, I come back, grab the neck, and go for the short elbows. Spinning elbows are extremely hard to block. If I push, I don't hit the shoulders. I resist my shoulders so I can't push you back. Resist. See? But if I go center of the chest, he goes off balance. See? So if I break the center of the chest, then go for the spinning elbow, not at the same time, keep that new defense against the spinning elbow. I follow a lot of the kickboxing matches they take it out. I like that kind of stuff. Uh, I like the bike headbutt. When we headbutt, we drop the head in, push off the rear toe, see dropping in the forehead. Toughest part of the skull, right on the hairline. I like to drop it right in the center of the face. Right. And then you go straight headbutt back to a circle head. Circle headbutt, the second hardest part of your skull is, take a little baby when the baby's born, they got a little hole right about here in the head. You actually stick your finger in there. See? And that doesn't heal up for about six to eight weeks and it becomes hard. The hard, second hardest part of the skull is if you had horns right back here, here and here. So you take the ear, that's just so it's on You go up from the ear and go back about one inch right here. Imagine that with horn. That's the second hardest part of the person's skull. So after I do a straight head butt, you form a horseshoe shape. I think he's taught you guys this. So you get a little horseshoe motion this way, boom, back in with what we call an inside head butt. That stuff will work at any range. Got it. Uh, there's other head butts, but that's all we really work on. Yeah, he's focused. Man. No, man. I, I used we used to I used to take a big heavy swinging bag like this to work our neck and swing it and it started coming out. We used to run, jump through that bump, hit right there. Yeah. Uh, we uh, also to strengthen our necks. I make my guys build their necks up for choke holes. Most martial artists don't. They got the big puffy arms, the big boobs, but they have weak necks. And your head sits on your neck. The stronger your neck, the harder the punch you can take. Now, I, I, I can't recommend it for everybody. God made me for fights. See, I got no neck. I got a real thick back, a big hand, so I was kind of made for fighting. Nah. <laughs> no, I don't have a girlfriend or nothing now, so I always think about what I don't have, and you guys are thinking about what I've got. Uh, I make my guys do push-ups on their chin, so here, you just come up, just kind of hold like that. And we used to make them come up on the boxing team, we used to make them come up, hold it, coach would count for 20. One, two, and just gives you a nice, strong neck. 
that shot. Wow, you learned to pinpoint the target. I mean, first of all, come here. Sir. Sure. I'm gonna miss a head, but it's close. Okay, what do you mean miss? Get something wrong. See, so no, your hairline goes from here all the way around. And that's a quarter part of your skull. If you looked at an x-ray, some people, that part of the skull is more than a quarter of an inch thick. You want him to get down. See? Go sir, after I knee, boom, I'm going to hold his head to make sure. You see what I'm doing? So, uh, I don't think he's going to dip down as <coughs> fast you get him from the head, but from here. So when you, guys, it, you got somebody that's going to take your butt anyway. So when you give a head butt, where is the target area that you're trying to hit him in? I like to cut <coughs> the face. I want to cut the face. Stay away from the, this part of the head up. It's too hard. The head is too hard up here, from here up. Any part of the face. You want to aim at the nose. No man alive has a strong nose. You break that nose, whatever blood you see coming out here, two thirds more is going down the throat. They, and you can choke them to death on their own blood, okay? You with me? But uh, just any direction you hit that nose, you can bust it. Noses are easy to break. Even guys that have the flat noses, you still break them. And the guys that got those cauliflower ears, you still make them cry by grabbing it here. Um, guys had noses broken before, they say that your bones get stronger when they heal. But the nose is not bones, it's cartilage, you know. So it actually gets weaker the more you break it. You all with me? Does that help a little bit what I'm saying? Um, I don't like teaching that kind of stuff. But <laughs> I work with a lot of my guys do uh, mercenary work and uh, one of my guys teaches at the uh, FBI Academy and got another one work, works right around here at the, uh, where the Navy SEALs have their thing so they, they come back and say that our stuff is the best of anything they've ever seen so uh, we just mix in why? the dirty stuff behind the, uh, the graph and what have you yes, sir. Walt Lysak is a kid of mine down at uh, Ludlow, California. Ludlow, which is not far from here, is near Springfield. He worked at the Navy SEALs and he said he had a three week course there and he said about the Gracies and everybody else that's come in there, his stuff is by far the most superior. And then I've got this Israeli commando, Mike Lee Canary, a real, and every time something goes, he goes over there and trains the commandos in Israel. He works with the FBI uh, Academy in Quantico and also the one down in Miami the police took with the guns and the knife tactics. A lot of my guys don't like the Israeli commando knife stuff, because their knife stuff, they don't they do not do the circular stuff like the Filipinos go, I've got a blade, this is a positive cycle coming towards you. Then when I come back to figure eight, see the blade's coming back towards you. So all this motion is negative. So some of the Israelis don't like that sea lot Filipino type stuff. They just plot and go straight to the neck. They don't come back and then go back in. I'm not into knives, I'm not into guns. I don't own a knife or a gun. I got guys give them to me all the time. I just give them to my son. I don't like motorcycles, knives, guns. <laughs> you know, you give me a woman, you guys can have the rest. It's just <laughs> stuff that hurts people or you know makes noise. Uh, long moors, helicopters, you know, dipsy dumpsters. You know, I mean the garbage trucks. You know. So did they say why specifically? Pardon me? Did they say specifically what in, a, what in your training is it? Did they say? That they the mixture, training? the cross training. See, it's not like I can take you down with a judo throw or pin you with a jujitsu. See, yeah. once I get you on the ground, it's the uh, the biting the elbows, the cutting. Like bleeding is not taught. Uh, face right here. Sir, if I want to cut this guy's face, that's not going to cut you. See. Uh, if I block something they do with his hand, I can come back with the finger edges, slice the top of the eyes. See, boom, they teach you how to cut people. Right? All right, if I'm doing, uh, if I'm coming in to set something up, boom, the neck coming in this way to set up a figure ass in the face. And most styles don't teach bleeding techniques. How do you cut a person up? Because most people, when they see their blood, they stop. But we're always trying to teach you how to submit or to knock them out but bleeding is kind of a lost art. I think that stuff still exists in Okinawa. You can go to some schools. Some of the schools have been. Yeah. Uh, so we add all that in. We just go back and do the research and find out what was lost and, and add it in. It's just like Muay Thai fighting. There's nine ways of knocking somebody out with a knee strike. Right? Uh, the Thai fighters, if I, if I, I drop knees, once a guy hits the ground, I drop on top of your knee. They don't allow drop knees anymore. Farewell knees. A farewell knee. 
is I spin the guy to the side and I hit right at the back. You got this uh, gluteus medius muscle right here. In here, you got a little nerve center right in there. Okay. My farewell knee is you bring the knee up this way, and it's like saying farewell. You bring the knee back across that way, you pop that little nerve. That's not taught in time fighting. That comes from the Burmese. <laughs> so you go around and you find what got lost. It's just like when I was showing you here the sparring. What I see most schools and sparring, they're always teaching what the last guy taught. They're always teaching what the eye sees. I try to look for, um, I always try to see for what the guy is not doing or what is not taught. And it kind of makes it unpredictable and it's a little more fun. It's just like you, most guys are going to throw knee strikes. They'll grab this way, you know. Uh, they're teaching the school. When you got boxing gloves on, you can't do that. Right? So they teach you the palm this way, hook on up, and bring it this way. Because what I want to do is get his head down. See, once your head's down, you can't get your head back up. See, because I'm just going to hang like a wet rag. See, he will slide up and bring your knee right to the side leg or straight up the middle. But the best way is just straight up. So you got a rising knee, a straight knee, a drop knee, a farewell knee, a jump knee, an inside out knee, a lunging knee. So there's nine different knees, and most styles only teach one or two. They'll teach a straight knee or an inside knee. And we, we show them all. So it's, it's just a more complete system. But the main thing in our system, if you, if you uh, get the book, <laughs> If I have to put these heavy books back on that airplane, pay the extra weight, <laughs> I'm going to blame you. Just go to the back of the book. I have a, I have a website. I have an elite private lesson. It's a subscription that you can subscribe to this kind of elite stuff that I'm teaching. I don't know it's elite because I know no one teaches it. So I've been to camps all over my life. I've been a black belt 41 years and I know what the guys are doing. And I just go, well, okay. I like to, I like to help people out. but. Rather than showing you a bunch of stuff, I'll ask the question the gentleman asked at the beginning. Well, I got stocky legs, so don't be showing me how to do a high kick. I like to specialize and say, uh, I think you should be like an elbow headbutt guy. I think you would be better fighting off the left side here than learning to come off the right side, see? And you just discover that. Or I'll see a guy throws a, a right hook to the heart. My style switch, switch it. We like to step on, we like to turn the palm down at protein position. This is about 80% of the fighters punch this way. Boom, down. See the elbows higher than up? A lot of people like to keep the thumb up. Boom. I'll see Mike Tyson, he punches the palm up. So there's different styles. So I'll say, I think you should learn to punch with your palm up, supinated. I think you should learn to punch with the palm down. So you gotta see the difference in people's bodies. Follow me? I personally, I'm a body hunter because I've seen anybody can knock you out here. I've seen very few people drop people here. So I love to get inside and go for the liver of the heart. That's just my favorite. And the hardest <coughs> punch of all to drop somebody is the heart punch. Do you go straight for the heart, drop it in, or do you rip it in this way? Well, not many people can answer that question because they don't know how to set the heart punch. What do I hit him first before I pop the heart to make him drop? Because I've seen guys come in and hit them in the head. Bah! The guy's against the ropes, ready to go. Drops down, hits him in the gut, wakes him back up. <laughs> I said, who taught you that stuff? <laughs> but you don't know, because you're in a karate school. Whoa, I'm going to go high. Whoa, no, come back low. Well, I'm going to go high low. Well, I'm going to go high. Ooh, look at all the stuff I know. <laughs> well, why is that funny? You guys laugh at me, laugh at me all morning this morning, okay? So I'm in a bad mood now. Now, uh, did that kind of help your thing a little bit? You know, uh, just find out, it still goes back to this old thing and say, well, you know, I don't know that much about elbows. You know, I don't want all those you know, elbow strikes you talk about, but maybe a crossing elbow, see, maybe a dropping elbow, or, you know, reverse elbow or something, you know, just get maybe one down. And I like the crossing elbow. And uh, one way you could do it in your self-fence classes, uh, I'll show you. I, guys, I didn't, I didn't get ranked in, Wait you, but I went to the school a few times. They had real good fighters in Oklahoma. If a guy's got me in a simple choke hole, see, I see him do this stuff on the grab, down, back to the face. See, I see this stuff, you know, rake the face, going back up. You know, there's all kinds of little drills. I see them go to the arm bar from here. But one of my favorites using elbows, grab, just grab the wrist this way. Is that what you want to do? And pull, look where the jaw comes. Boom, boom, 
two elbows. Nothing better than that. And that's it, nice and tight. Probably. Anyone mm -hmm. ever seen that particular one? One, two? No? Seriously? No. Seriously? Seriously? But see, I said, you've seen it. Uh, well, you've seen everything! God knows! I've been to Okinawa. I've been to Naha. I've been to Hiroko, man. And I'm going back! Because I can't stay in New Jersey. <laughs> Nobody can stay in New Jersey, Sparky. <laughs> Come to live in America. Don't go to Jersey. That's where we Let's send all the, the European States. immigrants. Come on. <laughs> Call me next time. <laughs> she. He's going, he promised me. Guys, look, he gave me his word. He goes to Okinawa. He's going to help me find all my ex-girlfriend. No, my former instructor, he's going to be my interpreter over there, right? I did good. Now, I forgot all that stuff you had me memorize this morning, but I had it down right at the beginning. All right, next question, guys. How we doing? How we doing? Wait, is this stuff interesting or why? Am I on the wrong track? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. I don't think you need to get them practice. I think visually you should be able to learn anything I'm showing you in the talk to all, okay? Is that okay, guys? So, who else had another question? Somebody else? That I do good, what do you get? You gotta get what, an A, A minus? What do you give me on that answer? Uh -huh. I gotta think about it. <laughs> <laughs> one, of one of George Madsen answers. Oh, I gotta think about it. <laughs> yes, sir. Joe, I have a question for you. Since in your, your last 40 years, yeah. just 100 words or less, what do you think about the progression of the martial arts worldwide in the United States? Wow. Or less. He said a less, right? right? It's like Rob asking me about. Uh, not very much. Why? I don't really think about it. I get asked those kinds of questions. Uh, there are a little few things I don't like, and some things I, I like that the fact that the. Uh, uh, and back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, the instructors, the masters, were the only ones got all the PR. If you want to be on the cover of Black Belt Magazine, which started in 1964, you had to be an instructor, preferably an Asian instructor. 1967, September 1967, I became the first fighter to ever get on the cover of that magazine. They broke the trend. And then all of a sudden, the tide changed. The fighters became the ones who got all the notoriety. See, they never made any money, but they got all the notoriety. And uh, you notice today, a lot of the older, uh, like the Henry, uh, the uh, Robert Triuses, the Ed Parkers, you know, uh, a lot of the older guys who ran this country, you know, they're, they're gone. See, and so I like the idea that the younger generation is kind of taken over. Uh, my favorite martial artist is a young black belt who can't wait to get out of his school and open up his own school. That's my very favorite guy because he's in shape, he's eager, and he's ambitious. See, and he's, he's full of questions. See, he, doesn't, he can take uh, time out for a hard workout, he can take time out to go and come to competition to prove himself. That's kind of like my favorite guy. I never wanted to be a teacher. I never wanted to be a fighter. All, again, all I ever want to do is, I wanted a place to go down every night and work out with the guys and spar, spar, spar. I didn't drink, so I didn't go out partying after the uh, those guys went drink and I went chasing women. But uh, that was the thing that I wanted. I had to fight every day. I had to fight. And uh, I always wanted somebody who could push me who wouldn't quit so I could go for like 30 minutes straight without stopping. But that was what I wanted. And I kind of came to this country. I started looking for sparring partners. And uh, it's kind of disappointing that I couldn't really find them. Uh, I went to Mike Stone first because he was like the big guy, but he only wanted to spar for real. Then I went to the JK because they all said, well, we're the most supreme. Yeah, you're the most arrogant, but I don't think you're the greatest, you know. And then uh, Chuck Norris, 1965, December, he asked me to come down to his school. And he was the first guy that said, come on down, I'll spar you. So that, he, that was kind of nice. Uh, but I've missed all that. That's what I really like, that camaraderie kind of thing, you know. And to be able to say, no, you came from a good school. When somebody says, well, what style are you or what school you're from? And if, with real pride say that's my school because I think the greatest attribute of any martial arts and I think it's something we've lost over here is dignity. We don't dignify our efforts. We don't dignify the struggles and the trials that we went through. So we don't dignify our training, follow me? And when you start losing that dignity, it kind of strips you of what it means to be a black belt, what it means to be a member of this school, what it means to be a martial artist. Does that make sense? So 
I think the main word is dignity. If we could bring that back to the martial arts, follow me, where people could look at, look at teaching martial arts as a profession, not as a job. Okay, like the difference between a college and universities. Universities, you learn a profession. All right? College, you just learn a craft. I don't know if you knew that, or not, but so the same thing. I would like martial arts to look at it like it's a university, and we're not just learning uh, a craft. We're learning a profession. That would bring a little more dignity back to us. See, then the older guys, you know, whether they can work out or not, they feel proud to put that gi back on and come sit with the kids. Does that make sense? Um, I'd like to see that come back. And if it came back, I don't think you'd see 99 out of every people that make black belt quitting. Because that's about the percentage. I would say 99 out of every 100 black belts, sooner or later they're going to quit. I can't stand a quitter. Okay? Why get out of shape? I'm 60 years old, just as tough as I ever was. Why lose it? You know, you train so hard to make that black belt. You train so hard to get that good, and then you throw it down the toilet. Why? What was the meaning of all that hard work? You understand what I'm saying? I wish if you dignify more, I don't think people would lose that. Does that make sense? But that's me. I can't speak for you guys. Yes, sir. What's your, um, your, your best for you? You happen on a mugging. You're behind these guys. All you have to do is you know, come move in and help. Say that again, Neil. What, you, you wander in on a mugging. You're coming down the street and you see some, you know, the, the muggers have a back street. Yeah. You get a free shot. Yeah. What's your best thing? What's my best what? Best, best free shot. Yeah, if somebody's back is <coughs> wow. Oh, if I'm gonna hit somebody from behind? Yeah, you want to put him down. He's he's mugging somebody else, and you you just. I need to go for it. Before need, you find out that he's a first of all, I don't I don't always think I gotta say somebody's life. I've seen some little bit of scrawny women. I'm not saying she's scrawny, but I've seen some big men beat the hell out of little women like that. See, and they survive with very few broken bones. You may have lost tooth and cut. You, we don't have any idea how tough the body really is. We're all, oh, don't hurt him, you know. You ever watch a baby fall? The baby never falls back. Which, which way do babies fall? Always fall forward. Why? That's mother's nature's way of protecting them. Because they fall on the face. This face is tougher than the back of the head. Right? So I, I don't think we give our bodies enough credit for how tough we really are. What part of the body can't heal itself? Get a contusion in the brain, that's about it. How hard it is to put a contusion in somebody's brain. But anything else, you can basically patch it up, it heals itself. You follow me? I mean, we've been here since cavemen without doctors and hospitals and emergency service, okay? And we're still multiplying, so we must have done something right for a few hundred years, you know? Unless you're an evolutionist and you believe it's only been 12,000, well, whichever is the right form. So, <laughs> they, they, you know, I got, I got some real religious black belts with me. And, with they keep, keep sending me these evolution tapes and Joe, when are you going to believe that the Grand Canyon was created with a flood? It didn't happen over millions and millions and millions of years. I mean, when did it come from an ape? You know, I don't know. I don't know. You know just, the vegetarians say, look at our teeth. We're grain eaters. We're not meat eaters. And then the, the scientists say, we've been eating red meat for hundreds of thousands of years. There's nothing wrong with eating red meat. Then I say, well, how are you going to find me to be 12 if you don't eat red meat? You know, answer that question for us, Joe. You know, there's all kinds of arguments. Uh, basically, a free shot. Uh, if if I, if I want to kind of s stop the guy, any type of pop in the rib cage here is going to make him boom. Got 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 me. And if I touch some part of his shoulder, he, he's already down. I'm ready to take him for a chuckle. That's just a little thumb. Just pull the shoulder back. Got me. Now that will stop the incident. And that's basically all you got to. Now I can go for a choke or whatever. Okay. Usually I like to hook the eye socket. See to lift the head up to go for the choke. I love chokes, but I don't choke them here. I always set them down. And so I don't choke the arms. It's always with the back. So you know, always with the back when they choke. So the arms stay relaxed. That's what I prefer to do. All right, but if I'm going for the free shot, it's going to be an elbow straight at the base of the skull. Boom, right there. And you won't go down. I've seen people take two fingers and hit that nerve and put people in the sleep. I can't do it, but I've seen it done. I don't think you'd do it to me, so I wouldn't try to do it to somebody else. Got me? But you could do <coughs> something simple like that if you want to stop them real fast. Why are you asking me a question like that for? <laughs> I, I, I can actually, well, for example, with, with all the white stuff, people getting out in the aisles and going, you know, to the you know, cemetery and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I
the playing stuff. stuff. Yeah. yeah. I usually like to choke. I usually I prefer to choke myself because I've choked out maybe five guys for real in real life, and three of them went unconscious before I got the choke on. Because when I go for the choke, basically you do just some of the I pull the elbow forward and I push the other shoulder back. See which spins him. See he's in a slight spin as I take a quarter turn. Quarter turn here, quarter turn now, halfway behind. And then as soon as I spin, this arm comes right across that break your plate. Pow! He's unconscious right there. Pow! So I usually just slap that thing in there real hard. And there's hundreds of nerves which come off your face and go down the side of your neck. See? It's not just a brachial plexus, it's a chronic sinus. It's not that one nerve. Anywhere you hit somebody on the neck, he's going to go unconscious. Got me? Play it by ear. Personally, I, I always feel safe when I grab clothing. See? Because if I try to grab the arm, the body, like we learn in Christ, so it's just like from behind I grab the clothing. If I'm in front, I'm going to grab the clothing. See? And when I pull that clothing, I've got total control of it. See? Right, it's true. When you grab this clothing, it's going to turn around to you and you're your elbow coming behind your other elbow. Uh, yeah, you never know. I mean, I've seen, I've seen so many black belts punch people in street fights. I've seen so many black belts kick people in street fights. And when they hit the guy, the guy goes, oh, karate guy, <laughs> take him right to the ground. So who knows, you know what I mean? It's embarrassing, but I've seen it happen, you know. I'm not talking about flunky black belts. I've seen champion black belts hit guys in street fights, and the other guy that got kicked or punched took the black belt to the ground. I'm not going to give you names, but I've seen it happen <laughs> more than once. I never happened because uh, I don't. I don't do street fights. I say when you when a, I think all wars start when parents start hitting kids. When you hit a kid, two things. I think you're teaching kids. Number one, you condone violence. And number two, you're teaching kids, this is how adults solve problems. We solve it with violence. So I don't believe in hitting hand, peep, peep. My body is my temple. You don't put your hands on me, and I promise you, I'll never put my hands on you. If people could just live by that golden rule, be a nice world. I know it, it's utopia is never here, but I've always lived that way. I never touch people. I don't go in street fights, and people say, well, how come you never got in street fight? But there's two things that get you in street fights. When guys go out together, I always went out with women, so that was rule number one. <laughs> and when guys drink, and I don't drink, see, 90% of all crap happened for those two reasons. Guys getting together and guys drinking. If you stick with break those, get away from those two. That's just the way I do it. Think about what I just said, though. You know. You're laughing at me for you. You're laughing at me one more time. <laughs> I'm laughing with you. But, <laughs> you see how much bigger I am than you? <laughs> hey, look at that foot. You think you can run fast with that foot? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. One more question. No, but, over the last hey, years. guys, don't you go tell Mr. Masson this is a goof off session now. Are you still awake? Okay. Can you talk real quick about diet and as it, how it relates to uh, exercise? In your way of life. Diet? What do you, yeah, what, what do you try to stay away from? Balance. Stay Everything out. starts with balance. And for example, I can't put uh, lemon ring pie in my mouth. I get sick. Okay? I don't like beets. I hate the smell of taste of onions, you know? Uh, and it's like, <laughs> again, when these girls from the Eastern Bloc country kiss you, you get garlic in your mouth. It's like, just certain things my body doesn't like. And uh, I just say, I don't like it, I don't touch it, you know. That's how I can find something else just as good, follow me. Uh, one of my black girls, Ray Klingberg's in there with that uh, body scanner, you know, you can scan your body and kind of check out. Yeah, they'll tell you, give you a comp computer printout, what your body needs. Uh, they'll tell you how strong your uh, immune system is. Your immune system is directly proportionate to how, how healthy you are, how long you're going to live, and what your... De uh, uh, ability to, to fend off disease or diabetes or what have you, okay? So if you do that correct, uh, carinoid, uh, sc uh scan, see what uh, uh, what's in your fatty tissue, because fatty just lodges in your hand or in this part of your body or right underneath the navel, you can measure that and it kind of tell you. It's kind of something neat. I've been taking supplements since I was uh, 14 years old. Every once in a while I'll go for one month, I won't touch in it just to kind of make sure my body doesn't get dependent on uh, not, you know, shut down on that. I did steroids one time, 1968, some bodybuilders said, uh, look, Joe, and they took me down to the 
blood bank and they did a blood test and they said, look at here how the, uh, um, uh, the, it, the, what's the dead burn thing that increases your energy? How much, right? Like, uh, no, the sugar, the sugar. Glucose okay. level in your blood, okay? And he said, look, so how the glucose level goes up when you go into steroids. They were taking Dynaval, uh, uh, testosterone, and Maximolin, which were the three big ones then. And now today it's like, you know, it's a whole drug man. Anything you buy at the pharmacy, anything, actually, all pharmaceuticals are 100% toxic. If you say, well, I take herbs, I don't give a damn brand. 60% of all herbs are toxic, see? That's just recent research. People think all herbs are healthy. Nonsense, okay? So I would say test your blood, test your skin, test your hair, and find out what your body needs, what you don't, don't need. I can't imagine anyone not being on supplements. It just befools me. Um, I take creams on my eyes since I was 18 years old. I'm six years old, I don't have gray hair, I don't have wrinkles here, no fat there, so I must be doing something right. I usually tell people, your largest organ is your skin. You can look at somebody's skin and tell how healthy you are. Uh, but I'm into bones, you know, I, I, I inherit a healthy bone. But your bone is your skeleton. When your bones, when your bones go, your body is finished. So I always say make sure you keep that calcium and so forth in your bone and keep that bone mineral density going right, by doing some kind of resistance training. If it's just push-ups or parametrics, I can't imagine any martial artist not doing some type of weight training. Just I don't understand why people don't do it. Because it's the, the fastest way, the best way to shape your body and to improve your metabolism. You got me? So that's just sort of my recommendation. I have some other secrets, but I'm not going to let them out. <laughs> Because I got another book I want to do down the road. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I think I did something right. It's, it's it, you know, it's a lot of it's genetics. You know, I'm sure it's 97% genes. But uh, you know, the other three percent is the secret stuff. I think it's very, very, very important. And uh, you know, you can't beat you know a good diet. You know, the balanced diet, the right amount of sleep. You know. Uh, the right woman, you know, the, all this good stuff, and uh, <laughs> the right amount of training. And too many people don't take, don't eat the right food, don't get the right amount of sleep. I'll, I'll say one of my things that I do do is uh, learn to achieve silence in the mind. People call it peace of mind. Most people go to bed at night, they lay in bed, and the mind's going like, I've learned to put my mind to sleep. I used to do that in school a <laughs> lot. I think that's a secret, you know. And I'm not into meditation, but I, it's a form of self-meditation, a form of self-hypnosis, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, hitting that alpha zone, blah, 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 and just learning to achieve that inner silence in the mind. I think that has a lot to do with getting rid of the stress in the body, which brings on, I think, 90% of all the diseases. Does that make sense? And I'm not going to tell you how to do it, but I think the people who are doing something like that uh, now we used to go, no, we used to get on a hard concrete floor on our knees and the ball's feet and sing those songs, call and all, you know, Joe, 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 let me tell you, you know. And I'd sit there, God, God, knows me. And, and then we'd have to meditate, and, and I'd think, it, boy, I've never heard this word, meditate. And we'd sit there and meditate, meditate, meditate. And so I asked him, how do you meditate? And one of the guys that spoke English said, you think about things like speed, blah, blah. Well, that's the worst thing you're doing if you're trying to meditate. You know, think about something, don't conceptually think. To learn to achieve silence, the mind only works one of two ways. You see picture images or you think in word concepts. That's it. Even on the abstract level, when you go into uh, the abstract plane where you start thinking in principles, you're think, still thinking in concept level. So if you can learn to free the mind of the concepts and free the mind of any picture images. And if you guys look, learn how to teach real sparring, that's that zone, that zen level you take just as you squeeze the trigger to attack somebody. You gotta learn to hit that, that zone, that mark. And when you do, your opponent won't see you coming. Does that make sense? So there's a combination between, there's things that work for the diet, the health, and so forth, which actually carry over into the fight. That help a little bit what I'm saying? Good, good, I just made that. No, some of that stuff. <laughs> I talk a little bit about that, the implicit, the implicit level of consciousness, what does that mean, you know, how to hit that zone. I speak about it uh, a little bit above, but not too extreme because only about 10% of martial artists are interested in it. So you got to watch what you say. You know, it's like uh, uh, nutrients and weight training. You know, martial artists go, what? Where does this guy come from? I think eventually the, the best dojos in the world are going to have supplements for sale and have
half the gym is going to be kind of a, a resistance training facility, and the other half is going to be like doing, you know, the, the grappling, you know, the upright stuff. I think that's the, the, the martial arts center of the future. And one reason why I said, if you look at the URSA certificate, URSA, which is the largest chain of health clubs in the world, the demographics, 38 million people in this country are active members of health clubs. I bet you there's not more than 5 million active members of karate schools in this nation. So that means in every city you go to, for every 10 people who do something in the fitness industry, one's <laughs> going to go to a karate school and the other nine are going to go to a health club. Why? The richest demographic group in the history of this country is right now from 45 to 57 year old, that age range. There's 72 million of them, all right, and they control over 50% and up to 70% of the wealth in this country. A lot of it has to do because of all these new inheritance taxes. Where do the people between 45 and 57 go when they get off work? They don't go to no kickboxing gym or karate school. See, I know they do some internet stuff, and I know they like to go have a beer, and I know like they go with girlfriend before they get home and all that stuff, but uh, how do you get those guys back into the karate school? See, that makes sense. And I think if we program ourselves, bring the dignity back into the martial arts and get into the health thing again, follow me. Uh, I think we're still a little bit more of that rather than the guys going to the local bar or going to get on the internet or going to drink beer or something. Does that make sense? Because uh, why give up, you know? You know, why give up? Why stop? See, that means all that effort you did and all that training had no lasting meaning. Probably. I don't know. Uh, how am I doing on time? You're done. You have done? Left. That's it? Yeah, you got, you got 10 left, Joe. Okay. I'll take one. Uh, wait, oh, uh, what's your name? Sure. Uh, he's, he'll, be, he'll give you one of these books for? 25. 25? Yeah. So they're cheaper out here in class? Yeah. So that means if you took part of my class, you get one from him for 25. Otherwise, right. you go in there and get it for 30. Hey, folks, thank you very much. Listen up. I got another camp I got to go to tomorrow. So, uh, <laughs> If, if you want to ask me a question, get a picture or uh, uh, whatever, catch me before I leave uh, tomorrow morning. Is that okay, Ray? Right? Again, thank you guys very, very, very much. It's more fun just listening to me run my mouth than doing those drills in the sun. Is it